So last week I went to the Birmingham Watch and Clock Fair over at the Motorcycle Museum near the NEC, just off the M42. Now it's five quid to get in, which is great value compared to some of the other things I've been to, like the London Watch Show, which was a yeah, bigger event. Cost fortune to get there, cost fortune to stay there, and it wasn't cheap to get into, but nonetheless it was great. You yeah, met some great people there. But five pounds, so your sort of expectations are a bit lower. Now, I've been running a watch channel for 18 months and I've done lots of research so all the videos I've I've produced I've researched um, because I want to because there's watches that I'm interested in so I thought going into this show I think I've got a bit more knowledge than I did last time so I'll fare pretty well and boy was I wrong there were some watches in there a lot of vintage stuff that I had no knowledge of didn't know what the brands were you know I was picking through things there were movements watch pieces, spare parts, all sorts, um, lots of clocks, I mean it was the watch and clock fair and there were what, lots of clocks and a lot of these pieces I, I felt really uncomfortable handling because I didn't know what they were. Yeah, I recognised some of the brands but yeah, there was definitely some stuff there that oh, you know, maybe if my grandfather was there if he was still alive he would know what they were but Christ I didn't. Anyway, so I started to doubt my credentials as a watch enthusiast and someone who should be purveying expertise across the interweb yeah, to you guys. So what I did when I got home, um, I had to think about this and I thought, am I an expert, an enthusiast, or what am I? Uh, I do open my videos to say I'm an amateur enthusiast, which I definitely think I am. So what I've done is I've categorized, made five categories they're just my five, I've just made this up, of levels of enthusiasm or expertise. So when I get through it, maybe you can spot yourself in this list. Maybe the list is slightly wrong. I don't know. Let's get into it. I'm Andy. Welcome to the English Watch. Now this channel is about me and my watch collecting journey and amateur enthusiast with an eye for detail. Always looking behind the watch for the story and helping like-minded individuals like you start your watch collecting journey. Now, if you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe. Please leave any comments at the end and we'll get back to you as I tend to. Right, so as I said, I've created a list of five <laughs> categories. Now, before we do that, um, I'm, gonna, I'm just gonna calibrate myself as the uh, amateur enthusiast because that's where I think I am. Now, I bought the Moonwash only book, which I highly recommend, and anyone that's interested in space, Speedmasters, this is the book to have. Having this, and then having the understanding behind the great watch itself, and all its flaws, and understanding all the iterations, I think sort of gives you a little bit of a head start in terms of other people that are maybe just starting to look at the Speedmaster. Ultimately, it still needs to feel good on the wrist, so we have to calibrate all this with these are bits of jewellery that you have to enjoy wearing. But nonetheless, I think this for me does give me a little bit of a boost. Anyway, before we get going, um, my watch of choice today is the Tissot Gentleman Powermatic 80. Now I put it on this, um, I think it's black, I don't know if it's sort of either very dark chocolate or black quite make my mind up but it's got a 21 millimeter lug width and I felt I put it on a strap and I thought oh I'll rummage through my box a bit and sure enough I had a 21 mil watch strap I bought it for my planet ocean put it on I thought hmm now nah, doesn't look great but you know green with green what do you think I don't know give it a go anyway I think it's uh, it's dressed the watch down quite nicely um I was getting a bit bored of the bracelet why not change things up that's what I say anyway back to my categories. So five categories, there could be more, there could be less, there could be subcategories, but just at a very basic level, let's have a look at it. Now, when I went to the watch show, um, I didn't have a complete nervous breakdown, but there were obviously some pieces there that I did single out. And I found a nice um, store that had some classic Omegas in, so they had a Railmaster and a Seamaster 300 from the uh, 1950s, you know, part of the original trilogy, proper old school watches that I tried a few on 
um, the Railmaster I really liked. It was, I think it was 38 mil, but because it had the iron core in the back for the anti-magnetism, mag, anti let's get that right, it had a nice weightiness to it. Because the guy said, yeah, try this one on, see how it feels. It's like, mm, yeah, it's, it's got a nice mass to it. Um, but these watches were 10,000 quid. I'm thinking, Christ, it's not my, yeah, this old watch. Okay, it's from the 1950s, but that's a lot of money to drop at a, it's not a flea market, but it's, you know, it's, it's a smaller event. And I'm sure if I'd have taken a card and I wanted something like that, I could have made arrangements to buy it at their store or by other means. But um, it wasn't going to happen on the day. Not that I have the money to do that, by the way. Um, I also saw um, another place that had some vintage Speedmasters, and they had uh, some 1960s versions, yeah, 3 2 1 movement versions. And I looked at it and I thought, well, I don't know if this is a, a 105 or a 145. Yeah, I don't know. Looked on the back and it didn't have the double bevel case, so I thought, well, this is probably a 145, but I don't know if it has the right pushers or has it got a service dial is some other parts of it have been changed yeah these things are a nightmare now also on the way around i went to the store and there was a, an iwc well international watch co that's what it used to say um mark 11. i wasn't too sure it was a mark 11 so i thought it was but i wasn't too sure um this was like a 34 36 millimeter watch uh, pilot's watch anyway so i came home and i thought i'll look up about Mark 11s and sure enough on the IWC site they've got this handy guide to buying Mark 11s which is great you know this is a vintage watch um, so check it out it's on the journal for IWC so the first one is decide whether you want to wear it on a daily basis or as a collector um, collector's item obviously these are old watches pretty fragile so you've got to be careful with them. Don't buy the first and only then start building knowledge. Um, so don't buy the first one you see like I did. Um, look at, oh, I like the look. Then go and learn and then make sure it's the right watch for you. So number three then, do your homework. You know, there's a number of things to, with all these vintage watches, they'll have little nuances of which ones are the special ones and check out these bits to make sure they haven't been changed for, from previous services start slow. Once you've fallen in love with Mark 11 and are ready to purchase one, start with a typical Royal Air Force Mark 11 or one of the younger civilian versions, not one of the specialties. So there's obviously gradings within them. Who knows which are the good ones and the bad ones, which one should be more expensive than other ones. Don't buy the cheapest watch. Buy a watch that's worth its money. I from a I guess a condition perspective and, and provenance. Um, and yeah, remember that the watch, you know, Mark 11 watch is a watch that saw military service. So, you know, it will have suffered the, uh, the scars of duty as it says here, um, which is interesting. The value of a Mark 11 is in the details. Absolutely. So you yeah, make sure all those right things are there. Pay attention to the movements. Uh, the Mark 11 has to have a military movement mounted, otherwise you have bought spares. Mark 11 case, you can sell at a third of the price of an authentic, complete Mark 11 and a surplus movement can only get rid of the low prices. So that's interesting. Uh, number nine, there are only a few flawless all original watches for sale. So there you go. These things could be Frankenstein's service, hash ups, you never know. And then keep an eye on the edges of the case. So. Yeah, make sure it hasn't been heavily polished. So that's good. There's some, yeah. You know, if you're interested in the Mark 11, uh, which I was, uh, and, and to be honest, I was looking at small uh, military-style watches. Oh, get on there. And yeah, I saw a few, but everything's gone crazy. All the price has gone crazy. So I walked away with nothing, but I did walk away with curiosity. That's the main thing and I came back and did some research again which I think is that's where you know, that elevation of enthusiast is. So let's get into the five points or the five collecting labels that I've created and let's see which one you fit into and wh whether I think I fit into the right one. So number one, I've called it the casual enthusiast. Now when I was in my local branch of Goldsmiths recently 
uh, I said to the guy, you know, what are the watches that people buy the most? You know, what's popular right now? And he said, well, most people that come in, you know, they've got a bit of money in their pocket, they're not really enthusiasts, and they just want the biggest, shiniest thing they can get for the money. Yeah, you know, they may understand that Amiga or Breitling are a slightly higher value than Tag Heuer, so they're going for a brand, and they just want something shiny and expensive, and they're quite happy. Now, I'd also say that there's people that are just starting out, and I'd say this is where I was 20 years ago when I bought my first watch. I wanted to buy a, a, a luxury watch, Swiss watch. So I saw one in the window, I thought, oh, I like that, and I bought it. It was the Omega uh, Seamaster 120. Didn't go in there, didn't go and look at anything else. I just saw that, liked it, the price was about right, so I bought it. Kept it for 18 years. Yeah, no harm, no foul. So that's where I put the casual enthusiasts. I mean, I through the time I owned that, I had no real interest in, in watches other than the fact that I had a nice watch. That's all I needed to know. Right, number two, the novice collector. So that's me from 18 years ago, 20 years ago. May have got that first one. I thought, oh, I like these watches. I think I'll buy another one. And I might have bought something in a similar way. Or maybe I'd have just gone onto eBay and thought, oh look, I could get one of those really cheap, just bought it. Not really thought about whether it was fake or had the wrong parts on it. And just, you know, blindly go on collecting. Now I think some of these individuals are people that maybe tend to pose questions on forums. So they're active in you know, some of the Facebook forums and tend to pose lots of questions. And sometimes you can tell that the questions they're asking aren't very well thought through. Someone will say like, um, is a Rolex any good? For example, or do Rolexes um, retain money? Because they're wrapping all of the Rolex collection up in their brand name. Because you know, they can't differentiate. So that's number two, novice collector. Now, where I think most of you are, where I am, where I think I am, is at this level three, which is amateur enthusiast, which is how I describe myself. Now, I've written down here, amateur enthusiast, they do a lot of research, and yes, we do. And there might be certain things where I wanna, I'm looking at a new watch, or I'm looking at a collection, and I want to research each watch. Now, if I then walk into a watch fair and see older versions of those watches or similar things, I may not necessarily be able to string it all together, but I'll know enough to, to understand what they are and be mindful and, and sometimes be wary of what I see. Um, these people are keen to learn. I am very keen to learn. But also, they like to impart their knowledge back, so tend to answer questions on Facebook forums. So that's what I like to do, I like to answer questions. And people write to me and they ask the questions and I, I respond back. Not with, again, with any massive level of, of detail or knowledge, but if someone asks me something and I don't know, I'll go and find out. I'll research it myself and give an answer back. I enjoy that. Right, so number four, level four, expert. Now, what is an expert? Um, I would say experts are people like dealers who handle lots of watches. They know what good looks like and what bad looks like. They may understand what's going on in the market. They may be able to spot differences between different uh, versions of the same watch, but don't necessarily have a passion for it. And yeah, there are some YouTubers out there that are the, from the dealer side that bring lots of knowledge, but they're not watch enthusiasts per se. Um, they have a collection and they collect them because they like the look of them or they're good investments, but they're not necessarily gushing about the movement or, or the history behind why they bought them. They're, they're very um, transactional and uh, the, the reason they own them is got more to do with, let's say, the financial side than the emotional side. Nothing wrong with that, but that's what I think experts tend to be. They're, they're, uh, they take the emotion out of all of it and you know, just focus on the piece, you know, the value, etc. And then number five. Now, number five took some thinking, and there's one 
or two individuals that I would put at number five that I've um, encountered. Now, one of which is a contributor to my channel and keeps me honest all the time, and that's um, Phil from Moonwatch uh, Universe. Now, he's a contributor to the great, this great book here. Um, so if you see uh, Phil from Moonwatch Universe in my comments um, calling me out, it's usually for good reason because he knows his stuff. And please do check out his Tumblr site. Uh, there's mine of lots of really good information about watches in space, which is his specialism. Now, he wrote to me the other week and he said, um, I'm off to see some watch aficionados. I'm thinking, gosh, that's definitely not me. But his, his passion is, is watches from Russian cosmonauts. So, you know, it's nothing to do with value. It's, you know, it's to do with the association of, of that aspect of space travel. And I think that's where you move from the expert to the aficionado because you're now more passion led than um, focusing on the, the, the material aspects of the watch, if that makes sense. And I think you could go from a number three, go from an amateur enthusiast up to an aficionado by focusing on a, maybe a, a small range of, of, of watches or, or, or it might be speed masters, it might be, I don't know, pilots watches, whatever it is, and become really, really experienced and um, qualified in being able to talk about them and, and review the watches and understand their significance. So anyway, that's where my brain was going this week. Um, so five levels, so casual enthusiast, novice collector, amateur enthusiast, that's me, expert, and watch aficionado. It took me a long time to be able to say aficionado. A few takes. <laughs> I think I got it this time. Anyway, let me know where you think you are. So this, this was a little bit of a random one for me. I was just trying to uh, disentangle thoughts in my brain. I think verbalising them to the camera um, has helped a lot. I think I'm definitely in, in that middle phase, that, that amateur enthusiast, and that's where I'll remain for some time. I think because if you ask me um, to talk about, I don't know, cars from the 1980s or 90s or, or when certain vehicles had certain engines changed or, or when Jaguar went to aluminium, yeah, I can talk about those things because I've got experience in those, those areas and I've lived through the period and, and been interested. And I think if you've lived through watch collecting for many years, decades, you'll have seen those changes coming through as well and be interested and take a note. I've bought watches for the last few decades but not taken any note of what's happened in the industry up until very recently. So my view on industry and the changes that are happening are from the last three or four years. I'm now having to sort of look back in time, but I, you only pick out the things that interest, you don't see the rest of it that's going on. So as we go forward, if we project further five years, 10 years, A, I'll be much older and much greater, but I'll be able to pull from those experiences that I'll live through now that I'm interested in, in this, this watch business. So anyway, let me know what you think. Um, this, I don't think this is either right or wrong. This is just, I say, me detangling my, my thoughts. So leave any comments. I'll get back to them. I'd love to hear what you think. Uh, give us a thumbs up if you liked it. And don't forget to subscribe. I'm Andy. This has been the English Watch. Take care. And I'll see you soon. Bye for now.